So good morning, everybody, and welcome. This is Lizzie and Justin from Third Space, and we are live for Turning Towards Life. It's Sunday morning towards the end of April, and Lizzie and I are here in London in the UK, and this is our 180-something week of bringing a conversation to you all. And we, Lizzie, I'm so glad to be doing this again this week, and welcome. Welcome to everyone, whether you're with us on Facebook, whether you're watching later on our turning towards life website whether you're listening to a podcast whether you joined us on the clubhouse app which we're experimenting with this morning you're also welcome to be here and um this is exciting to me lizzie to be taking up this source about relational power especially after having had our live event on this topic last week so mm -hmm. thank you for bringing this back to us yeah good morning everybody and we have a source this week from a re really wonderful book called Process Relational Philosophy by Robert C. Mezel. I don't know how you say his name. Justin, do you know how to say his name? No, I don't. No, Mezel or Mesle, M-E-S-L-E -E is his surname anyway. And he writes beautifully about this very important topic of power and relationships and makes a distinction between a relational kind of power, a power that exists between people versus a power that is a power over as in, I have power over you or you have power over me. And I feel really grateful for this source. Justin, as you mentioned, we had this as a prompt in our last week's live gathering of Turning Towards Life people, people who are interested in this conversation with us. And this was the source, this was the piece of writing that the people who came to the group took into their own small groups to discuss and to reflect on together in the way that we do this each week. And I thought it would be lovely for those people as well to, to hear us talk about it because they didn't hear us talking about this source. They, they heard us talking about another one for, um, by the same writer, the same author. And so it feels like um, a completion almost for us to have this conversation, having everyone else had it. Uh, they had it um, between them uh, last Sunday. If you are not knowing what I'm talking about, we did a live event of Turning Towards Life last week where very, very lovely people gathered with us in community to do this practice with us together rather than just us being the only ones who did it. And it was really beautiful. And we're going to try and do some more of those events as we go. Um, so... We're going to begin now with this source. So it's three paragraphs I'm going to read and then Justin, you read and then we'll see where the conversation takes us. So here we go. This is a few paragraphs from this book, Process Relational Philosophy. And it goes like this. Faced with inevitable inequalities, people with relational power will choose to bear a larger burden so that the weaker have a chance to develop their own relational power. Unlike unilateral power, relational power is not competitive in the sense of being mutually exclusive. Relational power is like love. The more we love each other, the more both of us can grow in love. To achieve this state will require that we take turns carrying the burden of love when one of us is less loving. But in the long run, your goal is to increase my love, my relational power, and for me to increase yours. As Luma explains, Luma is another philosopher, in the life of relational power, the unfairness means that those of larger size must undergo greater suffering and bear a greater burden in, in sustaining those relationships that hopefully may heal the brokenness of the seamless web of, in, web of interdependence in which we all live. People who live in relational power discover values to which they would otherwise have been blind. By listening with active openness, they help others, other people to articulate their own values more clearly and to bring a richer vision of value into the relationship. Under the relational conception of power, what is truly for the good of anyone or all of the relational partners is not a preconceived good. The true good is not a function of controlling or dominating influence. The true good is emergent from deeply mutual relationships. Thanks so much for reading that, Lizzie. I'm going to read as well. Faced with 
inevitable inequalities, people with relational power will choose to bear a larger burden so that the weaker have a chance to develop their own relational power. Unlike unilateral power, relational power is not competitive in the sense of being mutually exclusive. Relational power is like love. The more we love each other, the more both of us can grow in love. To achieve this state will require that we take turns carrying the burden of love when one of us is less loving. But in the long run, your goal is to increase my love, my relational power, and for me to increase yours. As Luma explains, in the life of relational power, the unfairness means that those of a larger size must undergo greater suffering and bear a greater burden in sustaining those relationships that hopefully may heal the brokenness of the seamless web of interdependence in which we all live. People who live in relational power discover values to which they would otherwise have been blind. By listening with active openness, they help other people to articulate their own values more clearly and so to bring a richer vision of value into the relationship. Under the relational conception of power, what is truly good, what is truly for the good of anyone or all of the relational partners is not a preconceived good. The true good is not a function of controlling or dominating influence. The true good is emergent from deeply mutual relationships. Mm. I notice when you read that, Justin, it's like a the thing that is most present in me is thank God someone's saying this. I thank God someone's found the clarity in the language to say this thing. And the truth of it is so resounding for me that the true good is emergent from deeply mutual relationships. It's like a whole different set of boundaries than what we have been broadly taught by the way that the world dominantly is. And it's such a, it's such an act of faith because of that, to follow and to believe in and to practice this kind of relational power dynamic. So when any of us has a position in life where we have the capacity to make decisions that affect others and we're in a, a position where we hold more power, if we practice inside of that with the understanding that the relational part is the most powerful medium, like for me to be in my power relationship with you through relationship and not me telling you what to do and me saying how it is and you falling in line. If we practice inside a relationship that's mutual and that we trust the emergent goodness that comes, it literally is a new world where things actually get made, things actually get created. We can be creative between us rather than just have things be a small version of things because I think it has to be the way I think it has to be as the person in a position of power. So I just feel so grateful that this conversation is possible and that it's being had and it's being articulated so beautifully and that hopefully the world is moving in this direction as well. Like when you think of really great leaders who've led you or, or wonderful mentors or you know, people who are further along the line than you and therefore they hold more perspective or they hold more experience or even a, a positional power over in positional terms. When you think of those ones who've done it well, the relationship is so key. The, the, the way that everyone's relating to each other feels so important. Mm. 
Yeah, I really love the way you're talking about this, Lizzie. And I'm also, gosh, I'm incredibly grateful for this source. And I, I was thinking part of it that's touching me really deeply here is this <clears throat> distinction that he makes between, I mean, this might be a very obvious way of saying it, but I can really feel it landing powerfully with me whenever we find ourselves in a place where we are in some way bigger than another person because we've had we've been given some positional power for example like i've got a position of authority in some kind of organization or in society or because i've been handed some kind of privilege uh, you know i've got the privilege of the background i came from or the privileges that right now in our culture come from the color of my skin or you know anything or because I've learned for a long time, like you're saying, like I'm a long way along a path. Whenever we find ourselves in that position where we have some kind of power that we could use, here's the thing that I think is so amazing, is I think that what he's pointing at is that it's really um, ordinary in our culture for us to use the power that we have to cement the position of power that we're in. And I think we're often taught to do that. I mean, I think that's that's the paradigm in in much of organisation, much of work life, is that if I'm your if I'm your boss, the sort of the common sense in our culture story here is is that my job is to be is to be responsible for you. In other words, I have to be bigger and you have to be smaller, and I have to look out to make sure you don't get it wrong, overstep the boundaries, make me look bad, any of those kind of things. And this completely blows it apart by saying the responsibility, if you have any kind of power, any kind of bigness in the world, is to use it to allow other people to step in and to bring, mm. is, to, is to undo your unilateral power that you use your power so that those who are not yet powerful have a chance to step into relationship, mm. which is what relational power here is, is that if you and I are in some kind of power relationship, my first job is to undo, undo the, um, I might not be able to undo the place that I stand, that might not be the point, but the point is to do everything I can to allow you and I to be in mutual relationship with one another. Yeah. And the other thing that I just think is so excellent about this piece of writing is, even when we're committed to doing that, I still might do that in a way that goes well of course Lizzie if I'm going to help you to step into relational power relationship with me I'm the one with the power so I know how that happens let me tell you Lizzie how mm. you're going to step into relational power and you're going to do it on my terms and this point that he makes at the end that what is truly for the good of anyone or for everyone is unknown when we do this mm. I can't bring this about by using my power to control you or dominate you I have to use the power I have to make it possible for us to enter into a kind of mutual relationship where something can emerge. And I'm just sort of really trying to find that, like the brilliance of this is it blows apart. I, from a position of power, I might go try to control you. That might be like, I might just go, I'm in charge, right? That's sort mm -hmm. of level one. I might go, I'm in charge, so I'm going to tell you what's good for you to step into relational, relational power with me, right? Mm -hmm. Level two. The third thing I might do is I might go, oh, because you and I have to some, be equal and be mutual, I have to give up all of my power and abandon it and just go, I don't have any power. And Robert Mesley doesn't say any of those. He says, use your power, bear the burden, so that those who do not yet have power have a chance to develop their own path into this and be alongside them. And I think that is just extraordinary. And it's completely outside of any of the conventional stories we have about what you do when you find yourself with some kind of power that you were given or was, or you were born into, or you were, you know, you find yourself with. Magical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel the same. It's so important and so magical that this um this is being said and I was feeling into this thing when you were talking like if I have 
power, if I get given power, and I'm in a narrative where I have to have everything turn out the way I want it to turn out, basically it's an opportunity to control everything, certainly over the people I have power over. In that realm, I get to control everyone. So I can feel that part of the human condition, which is like, oh yes, here we go. I've been wanting to control things for ages. Now look what I've got. I can control these people. I'm gonna make them do exactly what I need them to do because then I feel safe. And this is a kind of an invitation out of that control narrative and into a creative one, into a realm that you can't control, but that you can fully mutually participate in. So, so when I'm in the position of power, I get to do those things like you said, let's, let's do everything we can to be equal as human beings let me and my mutuality not throw away the power that I have and not throw away the wisdom I have or the experience I have or the things that I know, but, but have them be fully present as, in, as, as relates to the definition of mutuality. Like I'm fully here, you're fully here. You're fully here with what you have and I'm fully here with what I have. And as we do that, I have to let go of control. I have to trust that what emerges between us, given what you know, who you are, what experience you have, and those things about me, that between us something new will emerge and it will be for your good and for my good. So I'm no longer trying to control everything for my purposes and have it be turning out so that I'm comfortable or I'm secure or I'm safe or I'm delivering, but that together we can trust that something different will emerge that for me feels like what life is like, like like the life force itself is wanting that it doesn't feel life-giving for one of us to have all of the control and one of us to not because 50 percent of life then is cut off from having its expression whereas if we're in this in a kind of mutual way all of life between us gets to have its say gets to have its contribution and how could it be that one person's contribution is less needed in the world than another's like we were we we were all born there's there's an importance of each of our individual beings mattering just as much as another being mattering so this feels like an honoring of that truth that Yes, we might have positional power differential, but essentially, and in humanness, we have equal status. And so to not allow you to contribute because I want to control everything doesn't feel like it's honoring the fact that we were all born and that we're all here. And by virtue of us being human, we have value and we have contribution and we have something to give. So in a, in a sense, this narrative about power is a way that we can use our own power to let life have its contribution, to let life say what it wants to say, do what it wants to do. We can either facilitate that or we can squeeze that so it doesn't get to happen for people. Mm. And I know what it's like to be on the end of that squeezing and it's horrible. And I also know what it's like to be in, on the end of the liberation. And it's a deeply important, significant, life-giving, freedom-making thing. So I think, I think what, what, why this feels so important to me is that I know what it's like to be on the end of unhealthy power. And I also know what it's like to be on the end of healthy power and what those two experiences as this individual are, is like. And I truly want to be on the perpetuation of the healthy power path. And so that's why this piece of writing, I think, means so much to me. Because it's so important that we get a hold of this notion in ourselves in any position where we hold any cards that impact another human being's existence as a parent, as a boss, as a coach, as a person in society who's older than another person 
you know, any, any kind of power that we hold in a marriage, even this is, um, this is super important for all of life. Yeah. There's so much is happening for me, Lizzie, from all the things you just said. I was really touched by what you said about the difference between control and creativity. That, that one, one way that we use when we find ourselves with power in a marriage, as a coach, in an organisation, as a parent, in, in a friendship, in anywhere, is that we can use our power to make ourselves feel safe. Or we can do this, this, make this move that I'm just looking back at the source here where he says that we can use our power to carry something so that the person who doesn't yet have relational power has a chance to develop their own. Mm. And that's a, I don't remember exactly the way that you just said it, but again, I'm really taken by this. So this isn't the simplistic move of smash the hierarchy, smash up power, mm. deny, deny that we have kinds of power that we have. Instead, can we use, oh, I, I know what, what it was that came to me. Can we use our own power? We've talked um, often about right-sizing, about neither being bigger by way of controlling nor, nor smaller. So if I have some kind of power, can I find a dignified place to be that honours the power that I have in a dignified way? And then can I work to support you in being right-sized as well, in not being too small and not being too big, but being fully yourself and that means using my power and letting it go at the same time mm. and that's why I love this I think this is an absolutely extraordinary line in the middle of this the more we love each other the more both of us can grow in love and to achieve this will require that we take turns carrying the burden of love when one of us is less loving yes. isn't that amazing like I can think of all the times gosh like yeah being in a marriage and feeling oh this is a point where there's less love coming my way for one reason or another and the really easy thing to try and do there is to use relational power to try and get what I want mm -hmm. to demand that the other person you have to now now you have to you're not loving me enough you have to be more loving or mm -hmm. withholding my own love in response to the hurt of not being loved in just the way that I want right and Robert Mesley says, no, when you find yourself in this situation, your job is to carry the burden of love when the other person is less loving. In other words, to find in yourself the power that you have to be one who loves right when you might most want it from the other person, might when, right when they might be least able or willing to bring it, and to use the power to support love and mutuality in the relationship, which might well mean that you have to carry a burden, that you have to carry a burden of suffering, that it's not just the way you want it right now. And you can demand and insist or withdraw, you know, use all of these um, not mutual, not dignified moves. Mm -hmm. Or you can use your power to carry the possibility that the something that matters might yet emerge, given the right kind of attention and care and conditions. And that is so different from the consume a story we have about love which is that you're here to love me just the way I want and if you don't give it to me I'm not getting what I paid for and I have the right to be resentful and to withhold it, it completely turns what this is on its head and it turns love into responsibility and care for the something that's between us even mm. when it's really really hard even when I don't know what to do mm. And, and I'm just imagining, first of all, it's a radical move for many of us to imagine what I might do with if I'm in a partnership with someone or married to someone. Or What about also when I'm working with someone? Mm -hmm. What about when I'm leading an organisation? Mm -hmm. What about when I'm, I'm serving somebody from behind the counter in a shop? What about when I'm buying something in a shop? What about... What if in any place that we had relational power, we extended ourselves, we used whatever 
power we had to extend ourselves towards the possibility that I might do something and be something that would allow you to step in when you're ready. Mm. And it it takes a, it it undoes the um it undoes it undoes <laughs> it undoes the the meanness of it or the meat like my power is about me getting what I want, which I think is the easy way to do power. I just mm-hmm. get what I want because I've got power. It undoes all of that and makes it of service as well. Totally. As you were speaking as well, I was realizing I've been kind of grappling with this thing that apparently is a, is a kind of universal truth in some ways, which is to love is to suffer. And I'm thinking, I don't like that. I don't like that. I think I have some romantic versions about love and suffering and love having to go together. I don't enjoy that at all. And regardless of whether it's true or not, I can find my resistance to it. But when you were speaking about the burden and the responsibility of power and how loving it might be to behave in the way that you're saying, which is that when I'm not getting what I want, I love in spite of that because I'm not I'm not the I'm not the weaker one right now to use this language. If I'm in a more powerful position right now, I have a choice whether I start trying to grasp for what I think I should be getting from you or I take up the burden of being the person who's who has more power now and I bring love rather than grasping I bring love rather than withdrawal I bring love rather than fighting I bring love rather than trying to get my agenda to be met in the midst of your pain because you wouldn't be acting like that if you weren't in some kind of pain anyway and there is suffering in that. I can see from my own life really clearly that when I have to be, to bear the burden in a moment of power, as we're now calling it here, it's not easy. I have to draw on something much bigger than my habitual ego response in order to find the loving action, the next loving action, the next loving thought, the next loving. And it feels really radical in that moment because of course there's all kinds of justifications I could make for the withdrawal or the fight or the, well, this needs to be, this needs to be put right and you're not doing things correctly. And, you know, I can feel my righteousness really can come forth in these moments. If I, if I relate to these moments as if they are an opportunity for me to be in this relational power dynamic where I can see I have a different standing right now and I have a I I have the capacity to make a choice like I I have the capacity to go ah I'm not getting what I need because something's going on with you I can either dance that dance with you or I can dance the dance of love which means holding the burden in service of this will pass. We'll wake up tomorrow morning and this will be different. We'll find different ground, maybe in an hour or so. But that if I can hold my sense of power and loving action, loving choice, which is really hard, and as I said, is a burden, and is the suffering in it, if I can hold that and nurture that and believe in it, a really different world is made because half of the dance pair isn't doing the tango. And so then the tango can't happen, but there's something bigger and something more holding to return to because we can always, if if you like, I'm holding the dance floor. Mm. We can always get back on the dance floor when we're ready to do the dance we're supposed to dance but at this point me being the dance floor is more loving than me dancing the the distorted dance so 
I feel newly acquainted with this love and suffering thing in, in, a, in a wider definition of what suffering might mean. But it's not just love and pain are right next to each other, but that love isn't all sweetness and light. Partly it is, but it includes everything. It's a much bigger agenda. And so the more that we can grow in love by loving each other and doing that for each other, it's not like I have to do it all the time because we're in a relationship where this is a mutual, we're showing up mutually. So sometimes you're doing this for me and sometimes I'm doing it for you. And that's the nature of, of relationship and mutual relationship. And so to allow that vulnerability on both sides and to keep cultivating that trust that you can lose it and I'm right here and I can lose it and you're right here. If we keep doing that again and again, the kind of intimacy that can get made, the kind of connection that can be cultivated and the kind of safety that can arise for all parts of us to come forth, knowing someone's holding the dance floor. Is a, is, is a very significant something that's an opportunity for us as human beings that we all have. It's an amazing way of speaking about it, Lizzie, that say between you and I, that our role for one another is to, is primarily is to be the dance floor for one another when it's called for. Yeah. And that what that means is just to quote Robert Mesley here is, is um, my, my goal is to is to be such a way that you, that your relational power can be restored when it's diminished. Mm. That's the loving move, and you see that applies to yeah. intimate relationships like marriages and partnerships and all of that. But it also applies, I think, in the whole web of human relationship. Is that what we do? Is mm. we when when we fall out of relationship with one another in some way my move is to is to be that which will allow you to regain your power to be in relationship and the thing that you were talking about about um before about you know when we run into difficulty if if you turn your back on me and because you turn your back on me I just turn my back on you mm. well I'm out of here because you're you know all the things all the judgments I have of you mm. I diminish my relational power and yours simultaneously yeah and if and if I'm just, you know, when you were talking a minute ago about suffering, if I'm just a martyr in the relationship, well, Lizzie, I'll just do everything you want, the way you want it, just the way you want it, no matter whether I think something different, you know, that move, mm. then I'm diminishing my relational power and your relational power simultaneously. Yeah. I'm giving you a different kind of power and diminishing, but, but relational power is this power. I wanted to see if we could get at this before we end, that the relational power is the power to be in the mutual creative emergence of yeah. dignity and responsiveness and reciprocity and connection that's what relational yes. power is yeah and we're going to have different capacities to do that at different times so just imagine if we could if every time we have some kind of power to do this we could exercise our power in the relationships that we're in to it to support the other person yeah. in coming back in returning to a, a reciprocal place if that was our job then i think we have a chance of the emergence of what he calls the true good mm. in this and i'm just feeling again it's incredibly exciting for me to you know feel what it's like to say this and how much unlearning we have to do yeah. because we're mostly schooled in hierarchical power and control and staying safe and either fitting in with control or being in control but in one way or another feeling safe rather than mm -hmm. radically opening to one another and extending ourselves to one another yeah I have one last thought that you just totally inspired in me Justin which is one way of talking about this is in like a, a dyad like you and me power then I suddenly got thinking about the nature of community and how the more opportunities for this we have in lots of different directions, we can 
like support a couple as a couple or we can support a community as a community like the the different entities that exist in the world in our in our society companies um communities families are all going to have their time as those selves where they're not okay and for us to be able to call both on each other but for families to call on other families or organizations to call on other organizations that for me feels like imagine a world where we could ask each other for help on in all those different orders of sizes of entities of collections of human beings that feels to me like oh my goodness i can feel the that kind of edginess and the kind of impossibility of it but the but the possibility of it at the same time and how powerful to have a community that's really genuinely intimate with one another where not one person doesn't get to fall over like no one has got the burden of never falling over because we all have each other in lots of different ways and five people can not be okay at once and there'll be a five person something that can compensate for that during that time it just feels like such a an important natural something for human beings to have capacity for and i'm feeling so grateful to to be in this conversation and to be uh it's like sometimes i feel like we make a cave and you go oh gosh look at this cave which is like the opening if you like and then we can spend time like furnishing it and putting the table in and putting the lamp up and making the curtains and then the room feels like it's an established place rather than a newly chartered cave. We've put some little string lights in and made it feel intimate. And it feels like we're getting to do that around this topic by having the conversation. And, the, and so it's like the source becomes the cave and then the conversation becomes the furnishing of the cave so that the cave is now somewhere we can all return to and we can hang out and sit in the sofa and have a cup of tea in, in the cave kind of thing. So I'm feeling really grateful for that, Justin, and thank you for knowing what this is too, and for us being able to talk about it like this. It's a very, very meaningful conversation for me, and one that I think has got to in some way be the work of all of our lives. Mm. So I'm really grateful. Thank you, Lizzie. Mm. So it's like a wonderful place to end, I think. And I, yeah. I've got one, one more sentence, which is maybe we've been taught that dominating one another is what it is to be a human, but maybe that's just a story that we made up and that really what we're made for as humans is this kind of reciprocity that we're talking about. It's just that we've forgotten. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Oh, okay, folks. So we'll see you next week. And thank you so much for being with us and um, for listening and being in this community with us. We're very, very grateful. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.